All right, safety and hazard prevention uh, in regards to mechanical gas. We have to be very vigilant when it comes to uh, safety when it, in a, a mechanical gas situation. We got a lot of issues that can occur in the uh, industry. Okay, one of them obviously is electrical shock. Uh, never assume that the power is off on a piece of equipment. You should really always verify that the system is off by using your your voltmeter. Okay, even though the switch may be off at the furnace, you you just certainly just never know what uh, has happened beforehand. Uh, so you need to be uh, vigilant with that, okay? Because obviously, with electrical shock, it's the current that kills. It's not necessarily um, amperage or anything like that. It's it can happen, okay? So current between 100 and about 200 milliamps will generally make the heart fibrillate, okay? Um, anything higher than that it can start to hurt. Okay, 120 volt circuit will generally cause between 100 and 200 milliamps of current to flow through the body in most people. All right, so what we do to prevent that from happening is we use lockout tag out. Anytime we have a piece of equipment that is being worked on, we should disconnect it from the power source and be locked out. Uh, usually in the field, if we're working on a construction site, yes, definitely lockout tagout is going to be used. If you're on a service call, it's going to be either shutting off the breaker, shutting off the disconnect, shutting off the service switch at the furnace. Uh, that's usually going to be the means of lockout tagout. But still, you know, use the error of caution when it comes to things. Uh, such as that. So persons working on the equipment should be the only one carrying the key to the lock if you're using a lockout tagout uh, just to prevent any sort of accidental uh, activation of the of the system. We try not to work alone in HVAC but unfortunately when we are on a service call or in many cases in that sort of part of the trade you are going to be working alone. Uh, maybe on occasions you'll have an apprentice or maybe a fellow mechanic that's going to be on the job site with you. But I probably want to say a good 80% of the time you're going to be on a service call or even sometimes even on a job site all by yourself. So it even makes it even more important to uh, be careful when it comes to live circuits. We want to make sure that we test them before we do any anything else. Okay, obviously if it says here have someone with you that is ready to turn off the power, call for help or give uh, CPR. When it comes to learning CPR and you are going to be there with somebody else, the first thing that you want to make sure is is that you are safe in the event that someone is being electrocuted. You're not going to be that type of person that's going to automatically run over there and try to save that person if they are being electrocuted. Because once you touch that person, even though they are being electrocuted, you will also become a part of that circuit and you will also become electrocuted. So the first thing to you are always going to do is you are going to find the power source and you are going to shut that power source off before you can even get over to that person to even begin to work on, on CPR or giving them any sort of help as needed. And obviously you are also going to be calling 911 if this was to actually occur. We should be learning first aid. Okay, Anyone working on electrical equipment should take the time to learn CPR and first aid in the event that something happens. Now, Companies out there do provide training for stuff like this because obviously, you know, insurance reasons and, and stuff like that. But it is also good to do it on your own 
to learn CPR and first aid. We do not want to wear rings or jewelry when we are working on electrical circuits because they can cause electrical burns. We never want to use screwdrivers or other conductive tools in an electrical panel when the power is on. All right. You can create what is called an arc flash if your screwdriver or other tool happened to make contact with something else inside that cabinet. An arc flash is brighter and more powerful than the power of the sun. If it was to happen, you can easily burn your eyeballs, your cornea. It can burn you, your skin, severely, third degree burns. And if it is a really bad arc flash, it can actually kill you. Portable electrical tools. We want to make sure that the tools have a safety ground on them, the three prongs. Never remove that third prong on your power cords because now you have just damaged it and it is no longer safe to use. If you happen to have a two prong receptacle in a house, like for houses that are maybe built in the 50s and hasn't had an electrical upgrade, you can go out and buy an adapter that goes from a two prong to a three prong and you can safely use your conductor with that outlet and not have to uh, worry about being hurt. More modern handheld tools are constructed in a plastic case for more durable insulation and obviously for OSHA and safety reasons. Non-conducting ladders, aluminum ladders can be a hazardous if they come in contact with power lines. Uh, when it comes to ladders, you really should be using fiberglass uh, for your, your ladders. Fiberglass is a non-conducting material. And if it was to come in contact with a, a power line or some sort of power source, it, it is a little bit more safer to, to use. Uh, wood. Uh, obviously, I disagree with the use of wood ladders because wood, over time, uh, breaks down and starts to rot. Uh, but yeah, wood can be used, uh, but I, I personally don't recommend it. Uh, pressure vessels and piping in this trade, yes, you are going to be running into a lot of pressure vessels and a lot of piping in this, especially when it comes to the refrigeration cycle and all that stuff. Okay, pressure vessels in uh, can increase over temperature and pressure. The hotter it is outside, the more pressure is going to be inside your, your pressure vessels, and they are a potential danger for possible explosion. Uh, refrigerant cylinders should be stored in an upright position. If you are going to be in uh, traveling around in your van, you shouldn't be having them roll around the back of your van and stuff like that. Uh, large cylinders should be moved only when the protective cap is in place. For example, nitrogen cylinders. Anytime you are going to move any sort of pressure vessel in this industry, you need to make sure that it is properly secured and not going to fall over. Uh, large cylinders should be secured on a cart that is designed to move that cylinder. If you need help moving a cylinder, obviously go out and seek that help to move it properly. That way it doesn't hurt you or the person next to you or happen to fall over and go through your next door neighbor's house. Always wear gloves and eye protection when you are dealing with pressure vessels because God forbid something was to happen. Shrapnel can get into you and, and hurt you. So obviously use a lot of caution when it comes to using pressure vessels. Okay, always use precautions to prevent that tank from falling over. If the valve stem was to break off, the tank can become a projectile. We do not ever want to see that. In this case, here's an R22 cylinder. Okay, that guy's going to become a missile. Um, I do believe Mythbusters did an episode on uh, pressure vessels such as this where they did break off the head of a of a nitrogen cylinder. Uh, nitrogen cylinders can have up to 2,500 pounds of, PA, uh, of pressure inside them. So if that head was to break off, 
it actually has the potential to go through at least two cinder block walls. So be very careful when it comes to pressure vessels. Okay, electrical hazards. Always use caution when working on or around an electrical circuit. Okay, uncontrolled electrical current flow can result in an electrical shock or burn. Um, even when it comes to working on HVAC equipment, believe it or not, you can actually get shocked just by simply touching the metal cabinet of the furnace because there may be a wire that may be frayed or the insulation may have broken off and a piece of wire is actually touching the cabinet. And when you go to touch it, you get a little shock. Okay, so always follow lockout tagout procedures when working on HVAC equipment and always exercise caution when working on your live circuits. Again, never assume that the power is off. Always verify that the power is off. And do not come in contact with energized conductors at all possible. Okay, the problem is with electrical hazards, they are really not known until something actually happens. So always check with a meter to see whether or not the circuit is actually energized or say even if the, the furnace cabinet is energized with any sort of electrical charge. Okay, a shock occurs when you become a part of that circuit. Remember, your body is made up of mostly water. Okay, water and electricity really does not mix very well. Okay, so the severity of the shock is determined by the voltage, your current, and the path the current takes as it flows through the body. Okay, current flows through the heart, it can be fatal. Okay, simply um, a 24 volt circuit in this industry can technically kill us. Okay, our body is made of mostly water. It really all depends on which way the electricity f goes through our body. So to prevent the electrical shock, always wear insulated boots and do not stand in water while working on equipment. Okay. Unfortunately, in our industry, we are going to be working in all elements. We're going to be working in the rain. We're going to be working in the snow, the wind, okay, the cold environments, really hot attics. We need to be always on top of our game when it comes to dealing with the electricity. Okay, Wearing rubber boots, wearing your work boots, they have rubber soles on them. Those are one of the precautions that we can use to try to prevent electrical shock. Grounding wires are there for a reason. Okay, the green wire that you see there, those things are there to prevent uh, and protect against electrical shock. Okay, the ground wire provides that alternative path for current to take. In the event that something was to have a uh, a frayed wire or or something like that. That ground wire is there. Remember, electricity always wants to find its way to ground. Okay, think about like lightning bolts and stuff like that. Where does it go? Okay, it hits the ground. So that's what the ground wire is. It's electricity. All tools should be properly grounded. Okay, do not use tools that have damaged or missing ground prongs. If they do, that piece of equipment is no longer to be used and should be thrown away or repaired with the proper prongs. Okay, so here we have a two prong uh, electrical cord here. One side is our line, the other one is our neutral. Ungrounded tools have two prongs. Okay, these are no longer to be used in our industry. However, tools are still out there that do have them. Okay, if the tool becomes grounded, current can flow through the tool and through the user and then through ground. Okay, we know, do not want that to happen. So we have our three-prong grounding uh, cords. Okay, your grounding tool prongs will have your line, your neutral, and your ground. That ground wire should never be taken off. If the tool was to become grounded, the current will flow to ground through the ground prong protecting the user. Okay, so if that was to ever happen, we are now technically safe and we have a less chance of becoming a part of the circuit. Okay, if a wall outlet has 
only two connections, and the tool has three prongs. Use an adapter. Go to Home Depot. Go to Lowe's. Go and buy them. They're like, I think, a dollar or something like that. Go and buy one. Keep it in the back of your truck. Put it in your tool bag, whatever, okay, because it's something that is going to be uh, something that will save your life. Okay, plastic case tools are double insulated and often have only two prongs. Okay, your battery operated tools are convenient and obviously more safer to have and obviously more portable. At least you don't have to have an extension cord everywhere you go. Okay, ground fault circuit interrupters or GFCIs sense small electrical leaks to ground. They are by code, they need to be in your, you know, bathroom, your, uh, maybe in your, your kitchens, anywhere where we're close to a water source, you're going to see a ground uh, GFCI. Avoid wearing metallic jewelry while working on electrical circuits. Anything that is metallic is going to conduct electricity and is a more potential for electrical shock. You never use screwdrivers in an electrical panel when the power is on, and always burns can result from an electric spark, like I said before, your arc flash. We do not want that to happen. Okay, if a screwdriver slips and makes contact between a hot terminal and a ground terminal, we can create a spark or a massive arc flash and get hurt. Okay, always use non-conducting ladders should be used at all times. Fiberglass or wooden ladders are preferred. However, uh, it is always more recommended that you use fiberglass. Okay, ladders should be placed on a level surface. Always check your ladders for any sort of damage. If there is damage, obviously do not use the ladder. Okay, ladders should be free of oil, grease, and other slippering objects, objects on them. So uh, it's good practice to occasionally maybe clean the ladder and free of any sort of debris that may be on it. Okay, ladders should have not slip resistant feet on them. If they are missing the little rubber booties on the bottom, no longer used, that ladder needs to be tossed, it needs to be thrown away, get a new one. Always secure the ladder in place whenever possible. If you are using a ladder and going up onto a roof, OSHA requires that the ladder be extended three feet above the roof line which means that is three rungs above the roof. Once the ladder is in that proper place, you are now supposed to properly tie it off and secure it to the roof so that it no longer is able to move. Okay, you use a bungee cord, you use some sort of means to properly secure that ladder so that it doesn't fall off or fall down and leave you stranded on the roof. Okay, heat related issues. We deal with a large amount of heat, okay, we use with torches, we are going to be doing brazing, we're going to be doing soldering, we're going to be in hot attics, okay, when we are dealing with any of these things, torches and, and things like that, we want to make sure that we keep the torch away from any sort of combustible material, uh, insulation in the attic, other combustible material, uh, gas, uh, electricity, stuff like that. Always keep a fire extinguisher nearby when you are doing any sort of hot work next to anything like this because if you do happen to catch it on fire, you need to be able to put it out. Use a fire shield when soldering near combustible uh, material. A fire shield can be a piece of sheet metal. It could be a heat blanket. It could be a uh, heat sink paste that you can buy at your supply stores. Anything that is going to be able to shield the fire from actually setting anything on fire, you should be using. Okay, hot pipes and motors can also cause burns, so be careful around them. Working outdoors or in hot attics can also cause a lot of injuries. So I stay hydrated. Make sure that you are wearing the proper clothing if you're going to be in any of these types of, of environments. Okay, your cold-related injuries, uh, it can be just as dangerous as heat. We will be dealing with refrigerant. If we get liquid refrigerant on our hands, it can cause frostbite. Okay, R22 can boils at negative 41 degrees. And if we were to get that onto our hands, it can cause frostbite. 
Okay, if we're going to be in the cold, obviously, let's make sure that we are wearing warm clothing and waterproof boots when we are in those type of environments. Okay, cold temperature gear should be worn when working in low temperature freezers, such as stuff that's below zero. Okay, mechanical stuff, anything that is moving can cause injuries. Loose fitting clothes can be caught in rotating machinery, such as fans, belts, and pulleys. When we are in this industry, we do not want to be wearing stuff that dangles. If you have long hair, you want to tie it back, put it up in a hat or something like that. If you have any chains or anything like that, you might want to take them off. Okay, never stop rotating machinery by hand. That's kind of stupid. Okay, trying to stop a, a belt or a pulley with, by your hand, yeah, that's not a good idea to do. Let it stop on its own. Okay, jewelry can be caught inside that machinery. If it does, it can drag you in. So be careful. Use common sense. Always use eye protection when working on or around rotating machinery. Anything that happens to be in or near that rotating machinery can be flown up and possibly hit you. Okay, never try to stop a rotating machinery by hand. You will lose fingers. Okay, and I really don't think the boss man or the company is going to appreciate that too much because now they're out of a worker and now they got a workman's comp case. That's not going to go over very well. When you are moving objects, use them in a safe method. Okay, ask for help from others when the object is heavy. Lift with your legs and not with your back. A lot of people in this industry suffer from back industry, injuries because of trying to move things on their own. You will wind up having a lot of health issues if you are one of those types of guys that want to try to be Hercules and move things on their own, like heavy compressors, condensers, motors, and things like that. Okay, always use a hand truck whenever possible. It is always a good practice to have a hand truck in the back of your service truck, just in the event that you do have to use something. Uh, use pry bars and dollies if you have to. Okay, use a back, back brace if, if needed. Okay, pry bars can also always be used, especially if you're going to be working on boilers, uh, boiler sections, stuff like that. Boiler sections can be anywhere between 200 and maybe 500 pounds. I really don't think you're going to try to move that on your own, so use the proper tools to, to move things. Compressors can easily be a couple hundred pounds. Uh, in some cases, cranes are needed to move objects such as that. So use common sense when it comes to moving heavy objects. Uh, refrigerants in your breathing space, refrigerant gases are heavier than air. They will displace oxygen. They will become an asphyxiant. Okay, if you have a massive refrigerant leak in an area and you happen to be in that area, yes, it can suffocate you. Avoid breathing in refrigerant vapor. Okay, use proper ventilation when you are around refrigerants. Okay, special leak detectors and alarms are required in certain applications. Okay, EPA is what sets those standards for refrigerant leaks. Okay, ASHRAE standard 34-1992 addresses refrigerant toxicity and flammability. Okay, you can look up that stuff on your own if you so choose. When we are dealing with chemicals, we are on occasions going to be required to clean condensers and evaporators and other pieces of equipment. Some of these cleaning agents are acidic, and if it does get on your skin, it can burn you. So always be careful. Read the instructions on how to use the chemicals before you do. Okay, A lot of sometimes our chemicals are going to be used for water treatment, such as cooling towers. Um, and water source, heat pumps, geothermal, things like that. Uh, it should always be handled according to the manufacturer's directions. Always follow manufacturer's first aid procedures. If this stuff happens to get on your skin or in your eye or whatever it is that you are, are doing at the time, uh, it is always a good practice to wear gloves and obviously eye protection when using these chemicals because they can cause eye irritation, throat, and, and skin uh, problems. So be very careful when you are using this stuff.